Here we go. First big in of the morning right there. Oh, here, pal. <laughs> Triple. Got him. Triple. All right, here, take that. Not too dirty, JP. Ooh, too I dirty. Like oh, this, this is a giant it's a dude. Baby. Hey, what's up guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and welcome to Bait Fishing for Delta Stripers. Now, the first thing I'm gonna show you is the setup that we're using. With the setup that we're using is a basic sliding rig, often referred to as a Carolina rig for bass fishermen, but in bait fishing, it's a sliding rig. That is a slider going on your line, your main line. We slide that slider up, generally without the weight first when we're first rigging it up. Then we put on a bead just below that to a barrel swivel. And then I prefer about a two to two and a half foot leader out to a circle hook and I'm actually using a double surgeon's loop knot to tie on our circle hooks, which gives it that freedom to move around and function more. And I'll talk a little bit more about the circle hooks uh, throughout the film and explain a little bit more for that. The baits that we're gonna be commonly using when we're bait fishing for stripers is the Threadfin Shad, the Mud Sucker, often referred to as the Gobi, and Chicken Livers. So let me go ahead and show you how to rig these up real quick and then I'll break it all down as we go through our fishing trip and really fill in the ins and outs and uh, all the scientific approach to how you need to be approaching these baits and how you need to be rigging and using them to successfully put fish in the boat. Now first we're going to do the cut plug thread fin shad. Now if you look at his top fin right here and his dot, all we're going to do is line our knife up exactly in between to the back edge, edge of his gill plate right there. And instead of coming straight through, we're going to tilt the knife at about a 45, come through, and go ahead and disregard his head at this point. And now we have a nice little angle and once we get the hook through, this is what's going to cause the spin to our bait. So now we take our shad into this position and we go to the inside bend of our hook and almost directly through the center of the bait and under that fin, we're gonna come right through with the circle hook, turn it over, and then we're gonna come right back down towards the front of the bait, bring the hook back through to where the tail end comes up to the back of our hook and you're gonna see that crank in the shad just like that to where when it's running up to your line, it's, you're gonna have a nice real dominant bend in there so that'll rotate and spin around in the water. Now instead of using a egg loop knot or a bumper snail like a lot of people will use to loop around the tail and fasten it down, I have that loop knot so instead I'm gonna rig up some magic thread right below the eye of the hook so it doesn't affect how my loop knot works. Now what I have here is some sticky thread. You can buy this at any local tackle shop. I have it pinched in between my ring finger and my middle finger, and I'm gonna go right around my bait, right down here, probably you know eight to 10 times, relatively tight, but below the eye, and I'm gonna grab tight, and I'm gonna pinch it off. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna give me that nice bend into my shad just like that, so when I put it in the water, it's gonna rotate around nice and fast. So now what we have here is the mud sucker. Now it's a really simple way to do this. If he's alive, you pull up this little back fin and you basically wanna go right directly in the middle. We're gonna use a much smaller circle hook for these. You're gonna go right through the meat, right in there, and if he's alive, it's perfect. When the striper takes him by the head, the circle hook ends up right in the jaw. If he's dead, the thing you wanna do for rigging is come up towards the middle of the body basically right in the upper part of the back. And what that's gonna do is when there's current, it's gonna twist the bait a little bit around and often draw more attention for those stripers to hone in on that dead mud sucker. Okay, now last but definitely not least is my opinion the most deadly bait fishing rig there is for Delta stripers is the chicken liver, which I like to call the brain rig. Basically, they just loosely come through your circle hook a couple times just to where it's gonna sit on there and allow you to start threading it on. And this is when I take this magic thread and I pinch it right in between my uh, index and my middle finger and I'm gonna loosely start winding it around my liver. And I don't wanna come in behind my liver, otherwise what that's gonna do is gonna get down behind there and try to cut in behind it. So I'm just gonna keep it right on the shank like that and keep loosely going around and you can see as I shift it around, it's gonna start looking like a brain is on my hook. This is why I call it brain rigging. And you come around just like so, and you don't wanna pull tight, otherwise it'll cut in there, and then put it back in between your fingers, 
and break it off just like so to where your hook tip's exposed. You got a full on brain on that bad boy. This is ridiculously deadly. They smell the protein, they run it down, but if you drop a lot of fish, it's good to switch out to that plug cut shad or the mud suckers at that point, but this will definitely draw them in. Let's get out there, get to fishing, and I'll break it all down on the water for you. Okay, so today we're starting off on the Sacramento River, just a little bit south of Rio Vista, probably towards the south corner of Decker Island, uh, but more to the uh, west side of the river right there on the edge of the shipping channel where we drop a lot of stripers. They tend to follow that shipping channel. Take Check time, this one out. Time, welcome, welcome. Yeah! There we go, first big in of the morning right there. Very first bit of fish off the bat. Hopefully uh, we can fill up our bags with guys like this. Uh, what do you think, JP? Should we take this one home and put her in the box? I think so. It is a nice fish, man. Woo! All right, here's the other half of the team showing up today. Doug MacArthur from Team MC Fish and Guide Service out here. Have some fun with all the boys. I can now. Yeah. There you go, Nets, baby. Send it out. Bring it back. Here we are. Fish in the sack. Another keeper for the box. Welcome to the JP show. Mm. Mm. Now a lot of people that are bait fishing for stripers are generally just getting into striper fishing and they don't know much about tides. Uh, tides are really crucial because it's on the last hour of each transition of the tide. Let's say it's the low tide. The last hour of the low tide becomes before it becomes slack and starts coming back in is really crucial as the same is the first hour of the incoming tide. And the same thing goes for the top of the tide, the high tide, the last hour just before the transition point and the first hour once it starts heading back out. Uh, those are those key times where the stripers are going to want to actively feed. So it's important that you're baited up and you have your bait down before those transition times come. That's usually a two hour window. So you could have a four hour window throughout the day. If you have many tides, you could have a six hour window with three tidal changes. So it's imperative that you make sure you find fish on the graph before those tidal changes happen and you have a bait down because that's the crucial window for getting bit by these big stripers. Wow, eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> that's another 20 plus inches. You girls from around here? From your mom's house. So we asked another another nice striper to come up and bite just so we could show you guys about this ego net. These are pretty cool. You press the button right here, and you move forward and it retracts out the back and out the front. Check that out. So you can reach out there, get the fish. You just don't want to lift them up on your way out there. You can come straight back and then retract the net like that once he's in there. It's pretty awesome. You know, when it comes to choosing a bait, I'm often looking at the tides and I'm looking at how the striped bass are positioned. If I look at the graph and I see shad balls, and I'll show you an example right here, check this picture out. That's a shad ball there. If I see that, I'm often gonna use my cut plug shad at that point, and you know, I'll fish it down on the bottom, and if I'm not getting bit, I'll suspend it a little bit. I'll drop down to the bottom, take a few crank reels of the handle, and get that shad back up off the bottom and key into them at that point. If you're not seeing any shad on the graph, and you're seeing a lot of stripers on the bottom, and you have a good hard rolling tide, that's often a good time where a big striper is gonna bite, so then you would use your mud sucker at that point. At that. You're using a big bait for a big Look fish. That, if you see scattered fish out on the bottom, you know, small arcs, big arcs, you wanna concentrate and pull those fish in. So right then is when I use the brain rig to really get all those scattered fish to come in and uh, you know, they're all scattered out, they'll smell that concentrated protein, they'll move up there and start eating on it. If you get a lot of small fish picking you off on that, that would be a good time to go back to your cut plug shad, drop it back down there on the bottom, or put a mud sucker right next to it. But if you're getting big fish consistently on the brain rig, stick with it, that thing is phenomenal. On the light rod, this is fun. There's a nice one. I pull. I just keep pulling it about a foot. There you go. He's on. No. Nope. He was. No, I played a tug of war and then. 
Let him take it. Real he's little on, bit. He's on, he's on, he's on. Got him. Got him. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. JP, that guy's a beast, man. I once read books about JP. It started off J, then P, and then it went into this endless fish catching. Yeah. Uh oh, oh, oh double, hold it, hold it. Oh, double. Got him. Triple. Got him. Triple. All right, here, Doug, take that. There's about to be a fish on yours too, Doug. Hold it. Here. Oh, yeah. Left hand, left hand, hand it back. That's a big one. Oh, this is a giant It's a dude. biggie. Here, hold on. That's a big one on yours, Nick. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> A nice fish on yours. <laughs> oh! He's a biggie. You know what I did? I dragged it about a foot and I let it set. AP can't be giving up secrets, you know. This is the fish <laughs> show we're on here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Don't you go. Cinema! Don't you go. I think we might have a, another double digit fish here. Now when you're dealing with the fish of this caliber, when you feel him really start pumping and whacking down at it, don't reel, only retrieve the line that he gives you. I'm gonna burn up my drag here. You just reel down to him and come up to about that 10:30 position, reel down. Keep that loading your rod the whole time, just like that. Here we go. There's about a, maybe 10, 12 pounder right there. Another really good fish. So we almost just pulled off a triple on those fish right there. It's just, uh, I missed the one over here. I got the shrimp. Doug, 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 fish, fish, fish. He's on, he's on, he's on, he's on. There he is. And just like that, we got another fish on. He's be close to the mark. I think he's just under, though. Yeah. Now, the reason why we're not even bothering uh, to measure a fish that small, we're on such quality fish right now. Realistically, that could have been a keeper, but the best thing to do when we're hitting fish you know, that are high quality that we're going to keep is to release those little ones instead of trying to fool around with them and you know end up harming the fish and him not making it. He'll go on to be a few more years older and we'll come back and get him when he's bigger and let him do his work and spawn successfully and uh, come back with the rest of the gang and let us have some fun. You know, I have a lot of people ask me, hey Nick, how can I tell when there's gonna be a good time for those stripers to bite? You know, and I tell them, just like I said a minute ago, with the tidal changes, you know, there's always those windows throughout the day, but if you have a giant tide, a five, a six foot tide versus a two or three foot tide, uh, the transitions around that tide, meaning the outgoing or the top of that tide, are always gonna be much better on those larger tides than the small tides for getting bit. Also along with this, you can look at your 10 day weather forecast. And if you see that there's gonna be a big front moving in, heavy rains, cold weather like on Thursday, and you have the option to fish Wednesday, a lot of the time Mother Nature is telling these fish to eat up before that storm comes because conditions can become murky. So it's designed into their genetics to know that they need to eat up before the storm comes. Um, otherwise, it's going to be twice as difficult on them to find a good meal. Now, when it comes to my line, I like to use a line with a good amount of stretch in it. Striped bass are extremely fast to where if you hook one and he's out 50 feet behind the boat and he decides to run 100 foot in front of the boat, lightning fast, it's good to have a line with a good amount of stretch in it and a very strong line. I choose P-Line CXX and I'm fishing the P-Line CXX clear in this episode. And the reason for this, that stretch, is when I leverage up on that fish, if he decides to swim up lightning fast, my line's going to ex um, absorb a lot of that run, and I'll still have the load in my rod. If I was using braid that virtually has no stretch, if he That's swam up real quick for me and I was using a spinning rod, it's not fast enough to pick up line. So therefore, it's going to develop slack, and that weight is now going to be throwing against the hook and possibly throw the hook at that point. If I'm using a lot of weight, 
I'm always making sure that I'm using a line with a good amount of stretch in it and something extremely strong because these stripers have a very abrasive mouths. The one that just come up from the ocean like this, they have some good sharp teeth in there and they'll really uh, gnaw your line up if you're using something too supple. Okay, let's take a quick commercial break and when we come back, you're gonna watch one of our buddies battle a sea lion, literally, and we'll see how big of a fish Doug's got on the other end of the line. Stay with us, guys. Hey, what's up, guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and when it comes to spooling up my reels, I choose nothing less than the best, and that's why I use P-Line each and every time. Are you fishing the best? Hey, lion, baby. <laughs> Did you ever wish for an RC boat when you were a kid? And do you have a passion for fishing? Well guess what? It's time to do them both at the same time. With RCFishingWorld.com's RC Fishing Pole, it's time to be a kid again. So visit www.RCFishingWorld.com today. Ever try pulling a planer board next to your boat when trolling or fishing from a swift current bank? If not, you're missing out on one of the most phenomenal fish catching machines on the market today. With Yellowbird planer boards pulling your lines perpendicular to your boat, you can't help but catch more fish. Find out more by visiting www.yellowbirdproducts.com. Have you been to RustyLures.com? Did you know they offer free shipping on anything over $29.99? And with all the latest and greatest in bass fishing gear from punching tackle, umbrella rigs, swim baits, and you name it, there's really no reason for you not to be getting the best deal online today. So go to www.rustylures.com. Have you had the chance to fish the baddest hoochie on the market today? That's right, I'm talking about the Shasta Tackle Wiggle Hoochie. One of the most dynamic reaction trout and salmon lures that runs second to no other for pulling and triggering fish into striking. So I guess the real question is, are you catching all the fish you should be catching? All right, now let's get back to the show and watch Doug pull up this big one. I think. This one here looks bigger. On, now the rods that I like to use, if I know I'm going to be fishing dead bait, a lot of the time I'll fish a spinning rod. If I'm fishing deeper, I'll fish the spinning rod just because I can detect that lighter bite with the spinning rod. If I'm using live bait, I'll go to those bait casting rods and use something like a 6500 series reel with a bait clicker um, so I know I can let them run with it. Um, a lot of the time in the shallow water, I'm going to be using the bait casting rods too because I can use a heavier line and I don't have to worry about line twist. In the real deep water, um, you know, sometimes I'll go back to that spinning rod for dead bait, but if I'm fishing live bait, I'm always on the bait casting outfits. Uh, the rods that I like are 20 pound rated rods, meaning they handle 20 pound line. Um, that yeah, also is going to tell you a lot about that rod, about what size and class of fish that rod can handle. And if you look at a rod that's handled, to, you know, for that 20 pound test line, striped bass in the California uh, Delta, those right rods there. are perfect. Um, when I'm fishing off a boat, I like a seven foot rod. I still get leverage on my hook sets. I still have a lot of leverage on the fish. If I'm fishing from the shore, I'm gonna switch over to like an eight or a nine foot rod at that point. So I have a lot more leverage on the fish because I'm not vertical on him. Uh, I'm more out to the side of him. So longer rods from the bank, shorter rods from the boat. The action is crucial. That means where the rod bends up towards the tip. In the very tip is an extra fast, you know, about a foot back from the tip is your fast, and then it becomes, um, you know, moderate fast and moderate as it goes further back into your rod to where it bends um, more towards the mid range. I like the fast action for striped bass fishing. It gets a lot of backbone on the rod. When the tip's just bending, you have all the power in the back of the rod to leverage up a big fish. Um, plus, you do have a sensitive enough tip to detect that bite. Growing, yeah, he's growing a little bit. Want the net? Oh, it's gonna man. be a while. You know, this is this is what it takes. Now he's he's okay. He's another five pounder. We don't. Okay. Oh, we can just unhook him. Okay, have the quick release. It's right in the corner of his jaw. Boy, you got him, Nick. That's the planning. There we go. Okay, release. Yep. Hey, Doug. What are you up to? Hanging around. Yeah. See what I can spin. Yeah. Have you spinned anything good today to do? Be kind of nice catching fish today, though, huh? Yeah. I get a little frustrating. Yeah. And everybody else around us do it. Oh. I guess they're not either. Now when it comes to the circle hooks, like I was telling you earlier in the video, when I'm using a brain rig, I like to start off with a 6 aught circle hook. If I'm catching stripers consistently around the 5 pound class, I'm going to stick with that 6 aught circle hook. If I'm catching them in that 5 to 12 pound class, 
and bigger, I'm gonna go up to that eight-aught circle hook consistently. This is not too big of a hook. It gets an extremely good bite on the fish, and when you're assisting it, like I'll explain here shortly, it's a phenomenal hookup ratio, and it'll definitely outfish any J hook on the market. Uh, when it comes to rigging your mud suckers, what you want to use is that smaller circle hook because you can see how I went through the back of the tail so the hooks completely exposed the hooks not hidden by anything and that smaller circle hook just being skin hooked through the back of that goby like that you know this all you really need once that striper swallows it down that little hooks gonna plant into them you don't need a giant hook for a giant fish matching the hook size up to your bait is a much smarter more scientific approach to fishing and will often land you much more fish versus a big bulky um, unorthodox looking presentation now when it comes to setting the hook with a circle hook it's completely different than a standard J hook you know where you reel down the tip you wait for him to hit it and then you just jerk it up as hard as you can you know up to a 12 o'clock position a circle hook is completely opposite of that when the fish is just slightly biting, what you do is you stand up, you reel forward a little bit to where you get the slack out, and as you feel him biting it, you just start to gradually move your rod back. If you keep feeling him pecking, reel forward slowly and keep moving it back as he's pecking. Once you feel that fish is stuck on the rod tip, reel extremely fast and bring your rod up to that 12 o'clock position at that time. There's no reason to jerk at all, and this is a huge benefit to the circle hook because if you jerk and you're using a soft bait, if you don't hook the fish, you spook him and he runs off versus a circle hook. If you didn't hook him, it basically just fell out of his mouth, maybe an inch or two out in front of him, and those second opportunity chances, he just keeps picking it up, keeps picking it up, and surprisingly enough, you'll catch way more fish using circle hooks than J hooks. And I can flat out prove that to anybody or beat anybody sitting side by side with me that wants to show me otherwise. So that's it. We've hammered out our limits for uh, stripers. We got about a five or six pound average in the box. Uh, heck of a day out here. Now we're going to go over and uh, troll for some salmon over in Isleton. And, uh, but that'll be another episode. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. Yeah, buddy. Getting it done, baby. Team MIF, Team MC Fishing. Woo! That's how we do it around here in California Delta, baby. Getting it done. So a few days later, some buddies of ours talked us into taking them back out there to do some striper fishing. So we're kind of out there guiding them along and uh, having some fun. It wasn't nearly as active as it was the time before. We had much better tides, but we still got on some really great fish here. Check it out. So today's been a pretty slow bite. So we put a pole in to where the first person to catch a keeper is going to get five bucks from everybody fishing. And it looks like Doug's got the first keeper hooked up. And if that ain't a keeper, he needs to buy some bigger equipment. Heavy. <laughs> and I think he just won. <laughs> uh, maybe 22. 21. 21 and a half. Just keep the bend in the rod. Keep the bend in there. There you go. Yeah, that's about a 28. Yeah. Nice. Come on, Mike, land the sea lion! <laughs> I'm gonna come in on You got him now, Mike, just ease into him. Get the bigger net. Get the sea lion net. I got him. No mercy, Mikey! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> the real winner of the day. Oh, Hi hey. there, pal. <laughs> what happened? You know, another thing a lot of Delta fishermen ask me is they say, oh, I'm out here in the middle of the summer, but I keep catching these little shaker stripers. And a shaker is just a striper that's referred to as under keeper size. So 18, under 18 inches would be considered a shaker out here in the California Delta. I know on the East Coast, I believe it's 28 inches. I'm not for certain, but. Um, so when you're fishing for stripers, you have a fall run. Stripers come into the Delta Waste to spawn, generally middle September out here in Northern California, and they stay here 
through the dead of winter, they find those deeper spots, they hang out in the dead of winter. Um, when spring comes around, they spawn and they leave generally towards um, early May all the way out to the end of May, just before June. What you're gonna find is a lot bigger, larger saltwater class of stripers that are coming into the delta, um, you know, out from the main ocean. So that's when a lot of your bigger fish are gonna come in. Um, a good percentage of your males stay in the delta once they're born. You do have those native fish, and there is some big females occasionally in the middle of the summer, but when you focus on the fall, winter, and spring, you're gonna look for a much larger class of striped bass that are in here from the bays, from the open ocean, that have been eaten a lot and can take a much larger bait. So you're gonna be much more satisfied with fishing those uh, fall, winter, and springtime striped bass than the middle of the summer. And if you want to go look for them in the middle of the summer, you can do a lot of these same techniques right out there in the bay or out on the coastline and produce some good stripers as well. About a six or seven pounder there, baby. Woo! Right when you reel back down to the fish, don't drop your hand so quick. Reel down the tension. There you go, that's clean, there you go. What that's gonna do is it's also gonna shake the weight on the leader, and it can change the position of the hook if you drop down fast. Okay, now here's a couple of the latest episodes that you guys can watch right here. Jigging for King Salmon, Fishing for Spawning Kokanee. These are some awesome episodes, guys. Make sure to check out the rest of the show. We got a lot of great instructional episodes out there. Make sure you subscribe and click this button here, the yellow button there. And uh, make sure to stay on top of the show and check out informativefisherman.com. Thanks for watching, guys.